Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Courtney Drake and I'm with Avalara. I'm glad to be your moderator for today's webinar on Managing Tax Exempt Sales 101. Before we dive into a jam-packed presentation today, just wanted to go over a few friendly housekeeping reminders. So as usual, we are recording today's event. So if you'd like to listen to it again, or even have a colleague who you think might benefit from it, you will receive a link to the recording within the next 24 hours. So keep your eyes peeled out or peeled for that. Next, let's do a quick review of this orange webinar console that we're looking at and how you can use it to interact with us today. So over on the left-hand side of your screen, directly underneath the video feed, there is a Q&A box. You can use that box to submit your questions for myself or our speakers at any point over the next hour. A few of you already have, so thank you for that. We will be responding to questions individually as we are able to, usually more of a logistical nature, technical nature. And then we do have some time set aside at the end of the presentation for live Q&A as well. So be sure to stick around for that. There is a community chat on the console that you can also use to interact with your fellow webinar attendees. So feel free to use that to introduce yourself and network with the other tax professionals joining today. And then finally, down at the bottom of your console, there is a little smiley face. You can use that if you'd like to show us what you're feeling. There are some reactions, they're called reactions. So if you click on that little smiley face, you can see some available reactions and let us know how you're thinking and how you're feeling as we go through some of these topics today. And then we also have some links to related resources also available to you on the console. All of those links will open up in a new tab and be waiting for you when the webinar is over if you'd like to check those out. And then we also have the link where you can download your own copy of today's slides there if you'd like to save them for later or just use them to get a sneak peek of the topics that we're covering today. Just a quick disclaimer to get out of the way, a friendly reminder that Avalara cannot provide legal tax advice, so everything we're discussing today is for educational purposes only, but as always, we do our best to answer your questions as best as we can. And then I also wanted to remind folks we are offering one hour of CPE credit for today's presentation. For those looking to receive CPE credit, please note that you will need to respond to three out of our four available poll questions. Those will pop up on your screen at some point over the next hour, and then we'll give you some time to answer those. Like I said, we are offering three or four, but you only need to respond to three. And then in order to be eligible for CPE, you also need to attend today's session for at least 50 minutes. That's five zero minutes. Once you've met both of those requirements, your CPE certificate will be available to download in the Earn Certification box on your screen. There's a little icon that will appear and you can click that to download your certificate and save it to your files. All right, let's do a quick introduction to our speakers. So today we have not one, but two experts with us who really live and breathe exemption certificate management. So first up, we have Maria Tringali, who is a senior solutions consultant here at Avalara. Maria, great to work with you. Thank you for joining us. Do you wanna say a few words and introduce yourself? Certainly, nice to meet everyone. Courtney is right. We, Andrew and I do live and breathe exemption certificates every year. I've been in the software world for many, many years and in the sales tax compliance world for 10 mostly working with businesses that don't charge a lot of tax. So I am excited to talk about one of my favorite topics with you today. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks, Maria. And next up, we have Andrew Quirk, who is a product sales specialist and one of, or it's one of Maria's counterparts in living and breathing exemption certificates. Andrew, great to have you today. Do you want to say a few words? Yeah, thanks. Happy to be here today. As you can see, I've been in the company since 2014 as well. I had a few roles in that time, but my current role is to make sure our exemption certificate management solutions align to uh, your business needs. So happy to be on the call today. Awesome. Thank you both. So let's take a quick look at our agenda today. Sales and use tax is already confusing enough, but when you add in the layer of exempt sales and what you need to know about managing the certificates that come along with it, that adds a whole nother layer of complexity. So we are gonna do a deep dive into everything your business or most things that your business needs to consider in order to remain compliant, especially if you do have exempt sales. 
So we're going to start off with an overview of what the compliance landscape looks like for tax exempt sales, how it's changed. And then we'll dive into the four common compliance challenges that exempt sellers need to be aware of and ways to overcome those. And then we'll end with some best practices for getting and staying compliant that your business can start implementing today. And then, like I said, we do have time for Q&A at the very end. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Maria, who's going to dive into the tax exempt landscape. All right. Good. One of my favorite subjects. All right. Thanks, Courtney. So let's dive in, everyone. So certificates. When we talk about exemption certificates, we also have to understand our tax exempt sales. So for any tax exempt sale, you have to have the corresponding documentation to prove why you're not charging tax. The form, these are called exemption certificates. And there's a couple of reasons why they might be used. And there's a whole lot of forms out there. So we're going to talk a little bit. I think Andrew's going to talk a little bit about Nexus and how complex this world has gotten. But essentially, these are documents that prove that that customer of yours is tax exempt when they purchase something. And they can be a unique relationship between you and the buyer. They sometimes require some very detailed information and they all look different. And there's a, a couple of reasons why you might need these exemption certificates. So there's two reasons that we wanna think about. One is the buyer's business itself might be tax exempt. I was just speaking this morning with an organization that sells a software specifically to high schools. And so they were wondering whether or not their customers are able to be tax exempt. So in some states they might be, in some states they might not be. So that is the organization that might qualify for an exemption. This can also include education, healthcare, religious organizations, not-for-profit, federal, so that is the entity itself that is tax exempt. The other reason why you might want to collect exemption certificates or your customers might want to provide exemption certificates to you, that is for the intended use of the goods sold. Is it an item that's going to be used in resale? Is it an item that's going to be used in the manufacturing another, of another product? or is it used in something that's gonna be leased or rented? So what is the use of that good? Is it going to be installed like cabinets? So it's the use case. So there's two things we have to think about and the rules are not straightforward across all states. We have lucky for us, we have 46 tax jurisdictions. So if we look at tax exempt sales from a supply chain perspective, we think first there's a components manufacturer someone is manufacturing all those pieces and parts that go into building a product that might be sold. Then you have the part manufacturer, so the components might be raw materials. Then you have someone actually making the parts and that makes a, a bigger part and that part might go into making an actual product such as a car, right? These are parts we actually make a car. So in the United States, the use case, so those components, when he sells them to the manufacturer, the manufacturer is going to be exempt, number two there, because he's going to put those into a part that he's going to then sell to the car manufacturer. Well, the car manufacturer also wants to be exempt because he's going to make a product that he's going to sell to the next guy. He's going to sell that to the dealership. The dealership is not going to want to pay tax because they're going to sell that car to Courtney. And then we're going to finally charge Courtney the tax when she actually buys that car. So we kind of pass it along in our world. So that's a lot of exemption certificates there. So there, what was that? One, two, three exemption certificates. I mean, that components manufacturer might have been buying his raw materials from somebody else. So he may have to be exempt as well. So if you think about it, wherever you are in that food chain, if you're not the end buyer, you're passing that tax along until it finally gets to Courtney. And then that's when, when Courtney purchases, that's when it becomes a taxable purchase. But over here, throughout the production process, these are tax exempt purchases. There might be use tax along the way, but that's a different webinar, right, Courtney? Not talking about that one today. I think we have our first poll after this, is that correct? Yeah, we sure do. So here is your first CPE poll. If you're interested in knowing what percentage of your invoice or overall business is to exempt customers, 
Is it up to 25%, 26 to 50%, 51 to 75%? I know we have an option there for you as well. So just do your best and we'll give folks a couple of seconds to respond to this. And yes, use tax is a completely separate topic. Completely we'll separate. We can talk about it. Exactly. <laughs> And I want to, you know, Andrew's going to talk about some challenges for businesses that sell to exempt buyers, but I want to reinforce the reason why we asked this question is to sort of portray how important those exemption certificates are to your business. When I talk to businesses, and the same with Andrew, we talk to businesses every day. We find businesses get very concerned about a tax calculation, but quite often that can be only for a very small subset of your actual business. So understanding the percentage of your business that is to buyers that want to be tax exempt really puts a value for you on doing a better job of managing these certificates and making sure that none of that liability comes out of your pocket. So I always love to see the results of this one. Courtney, what do we have? All right, let's take a look here. So up to 25%, 40% of folks, that's the biggest chunk, said that it's to 20 or exempt sales account for 25% of their business. But we have another 25% that said that it's 76 to 100. So we have a little mm -hmm. bit across the gamut, but 76 to 100, that's a that's a big chunk right there and a lot of or a lot of document management you have to keep up with. Right. The sixty percent of the audience has more than twenty five percent of their business is wrapped up in those tax exempt certificates. So if you don't have them, that money can come out of your pocket. So that always, I think, reinforces probably why you're here. I know I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, thank you everyone for responding. Let's dive into the four common compliance challenges for tax exempt sellers. And I'm going to pass it over to Andrew, who is going to dive into Nexus for us. Thanks, Courtney. So yeah, Nexus, what we all focused on. So Nexus, of course, is you know the requirement that the states connect you to having the ability to file and remit. So obviously you're headquartered in a specific state, you do business there, you have physical presence, you have to register, collect and remit sales tax, like how it was traditionally for decades. You're registered in specific states because you're based there where you need to collect and remit. Um, but some states just didn't think that was applicable anymore in the digital age. And you know, over the last six years, we've seen a lot of changes there. And we'll speak to you know, why those are challenging now so let's talk about you know what has changed in the last you know six years or so you know you were a business in the past and you were headquartered in georgia but maybe you had a distribution center in texas or whatnot those were your required states that's where you had to register collect and remit but you know the states weren't happy with that you know they they thought that was too easy so a distributor selling nationwide maybe only has requirements to collect and remit in those locations where they have states. So that was their only, you know, tax exposure, if you will. And as we know, the states are always trying to recoup money. So what happened was in 2018, I'm sure some of you have heard of it before, but South Dakota took to court and challenged them on the fact that just because you don't have physical presence in our state, doesn't mean that you shouldn't be registering to collect tax there. We want to see that economic impact you're doing and selling into our state. You know, the state deserves that right. So the Supreme Court, of course, decided on the state side of South Dakota. And then after that, all these different states followed suit. And that's, of course, what we're speaking to. And when it comes to economic nexus, so every state has different thresholds on what applies to economic nexus, they can vary. Typically, you know, 100K in, in sales in the states requires or, or triggers economic nexus. And you can see on the map that, you know, depending on where you're doing business, there are different requirements. So the thresholds can vary, but you know, all 45 states in DC that, you know, require a sales tax requirement now have initiated the component of economic nexus in addition to physical nexus. And on top of that, some states or most of every state includes exempt sales into that economic threshold. States are specifically have their own requirements, but you can see in 
orange, which is, you know, a good majority, 40 or so, they expect you to include tax exempt sales in those thresholds. So you may be entirely tax exempt or a portion of your business, like we saw from the poll, but even though you're not charging tax because you have tax exempt customers, the states still expect you to register and remit those $0 tax returns or remit um, a return with every sales you make that's taxable or that you make as exempt. And we can drill into each state here, but they all have different requirements. So that's why it's challenging. To Maria's point earlier, if this was easy, Avalara wouldn't have been in business for 20 years. The reason it's not easy is the states are trying to recoup money. And this is a way they've been able to do that through these economic nexus thresholds. And that's all predicated on the fact that South Dakota won the case against Wayfair in 2018, which you know changed the landscape on where businesses have to charge tax now. An example of exactly that impact that the court ruling has had. So just, you know, give you a real quick example. If you were, um, say, a manufacturer in New York and all your sales were to other non-taxable entities, resellers or OEMs or manufacturers, you only had to collect a certain amount of documents or certificates because it's only based on where your resellers were. But with Wayfair, it increased that burden. And, you know, the previous exemption count, you know, might have been small. But now, because you have that footprint from an ex economic standpoint, you know, you're expected to probably collect, you know, 12x what you would have initially, all because of just being a manufacturer in New York and the impact of that South Dakota versus Wayfair ruling. And then the same with that national wholesaler example. You may have had physical headquarters in one state, but if you are required to collect certificates, you know, across the board, then now what was a 500 is 10 X and 5,000, but that's all specific to the requirements you now have to register because you're doing business in mean, all these states and the economic thresholds are triggering that you register, collect the certificates, prove that you have tax exempt sales, and then that to the states and then of course you know why is it so difficult because that burden of proof is on you and what that means is if you have tax exempt customers it's your requirement to prove to the states on why you get to exempt these customers and your proof and the burden is through that exemption certificate i hear it all day long when i talk to businesses where you may be selling to these resellers or just any exempt entity, and they don't really care about the form. What they care about, as I'm sure you all are here, is don't charge me tax. Well, if you have tax exempt customers, you absolutely have the ability to not charge them tax, but you need to have the proof on why you get to do that. And that's through collecting the exemption certificates. And it's challenging because does your staff now know what they're collecting for? Is it even in the workflow or in the onboarding of your customers to ask for a certificate? Do you have the ability to validate the certificates? Do you have an internal process in place on collecting the certificates, storing them? Do you know when they expire? So all these challenges make it extremely tough for businesses to manage it. And the impact of having a bad certificate, which would mean it's not complete, or accurate or having a missed certificate could just have huge economic impact on your business. I think the typical sales audit, you know, with P&I is 40K for businesses. So the ability to have the correct certificates on file when you invoice your customers is exactly what's required. And missing or expired certificates can, you know, lead to that. And there's always challenge around if your customer's business has changed, if they've merged, if they've acquired other companies, any of those you know, changes implicate you know, an impact on when you need to get the new certificates. So it's always a challenging landscape to make sure you have good certificates on file for your exempt customers 
when you're invoicing them, and then, of course, when you're collecting and remitting to the states. And I think we're at our next question, Courtney. Yep, we sure are. So just as a reminder, these poll questions are appearing where the slides are. So you should see it popping up on your screen there, but this is our second CPE poll question. This is one that we also like to always see the results of to make sure that we're giving the right context for people with the economic nexus triggers. So because of economic nexus laws, has your business had to or will have to begin collecting exemption certificates in new states? And then we have a few different options there for how many new states that you've had to begin collecting and because of economic nexus. There's also an option there where maybe it hasn't impacted where you're collecting exemption certificates. I think the keyword there might be yet, but then there's also an option for that, or I don't know. Quick clarifying question, Andrew, while we're on the topic of economic nexus, someone was asking for those thresholds that we were showing, are those annual and are those also state specific? Yes and yes. So they are annual and they are state specific. It's not across the board. So a majority of the states may have a $100,000 threshold, but every state's different. And we have a ton of content on that to help them make decisions. We have you know, free websites they can access, but that's why it's challenging because it's not across the board. Every state has its own requirements. Right, yeah, and just absolutely. to add to that annual question, because I know someone's gonna ask, it doesn't reset every year. It is an annual look back. However, once you've registered, you stay registered. Once you've crossed that threshold, you don't unregister and deregister every year. You can deregister. So if you do large projects and you maybe think you'll never be in that state again, you absolutely could deregister, but it's not something that you re that resets every year, if you will. Once you've crossed it, then you've crossed it. Yep, great point. Yep. And Lots then just as a reminder. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Lots of good questions. No, I was just gonna say, we are getting a ton of questions. Anytime we talk about economic nexus, the, the questions start flooding in. But I did wanna remind folks on the console, we have some related links. One of them is actually to a free economic nexus risk assessment tool. And that's where you can give us some more information about your business, where you're selling into, and then we'll be able to provide some high level information about where you may have triggered economic nexus. It's always a, a good place to start if you're wondering how economic nexus is impacting your business. But let's take a look here at the poll results. So let me yep. scroll down a little here. It looks like almost more than 50% are saying that economic nexus has impacted where they have to collect exemption certificates. So this law, it's been almost six years um, since it was passed, but it's had quite the impact on businesses, even for tax exempt sellers. So it's not something that you can assume just because you're not collecting sales tax. These laws still have an impact on you. And then we have another 30, almost 30% saying that hasn't impacted where you're collecting exemption certificates. And again, I think the keyword there might be yet. It's always something you have to monitor. All right, well, let's move into the next section. Thank you again, everyone, for participating. So next up, second challenge with managing exemption certificates, and that is the customer experience. So Maria, I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, thanks, Courtney. I do want to say I've seen this question a couple times in the in the question. So when we're referring to exemption certificates on this webinar, that's a generic term for whatever exempts that customer. It might be a resale certificate. It might be a manufacturing certificate. It might even be a letter from the state. It might be a direct pay permit. So we're using that word in generic for any type of document that proves that that buyer is tax exempt. Again, for the reason why the product is being used or because the entity is tax exempt themselves. So just a generic term. A lot of people get confused and think that an exemption certificate is different from a resale certificate. A resale certificate is just a type of exemption certificate. So just to clarify that, we're talking about all of them today. So let's talk about one of my favorite things or my favorite topics, which is the customer experience. So Andrew and I have been doing this for a long time and we've talked to, I don't know, are we over a million customers yet, Andrew? I mean, thousands and thousands of customers in the 10 years we've been here, right? And most people will say, oh, well, we collect the certificate when we sign up a customer. And pretty much period, that's all they do. Now you just saw on Courtney's previous slide that how many new states our customers are 
adding where they have to collect more certificates. 60% of the audience, about 70% of the audience has to collect more certificates than ever before. So we have to remember that that is part of customer experience when they're onboarding. It's part of customer experience when we pay bills, when we invoice them, excuse me, when they pay their bills and we invoice them. It's part of customer experience on our website. We can't make it hard for them to do business with us. We have to make it easy. And we also have to consider our internal customer. So our internal customer, our customer service folks that are there trying to collect these exemption certificates. They're trying to know what they need to look at. One of the questions was, how do we validate them? Well, I'm sure your customer service folks are not exemption certificate specialists. So we need in our, in the modern day business, we need to take into account that managing exemption certificates, right, is managing our customers well, our internal and our external customer. We have to make it easy for them to provide the right form quickly easy for us to add it and easy for us to apply it at the time of sale, but only for the states in which they provided it, right? So ERPs don't really allow that. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. But as you think about this process, it is not just about collecting something and filing it somewhere. It is about the process of making sure that invoice is proper. We have applied that exemption certificate before we invoice them. If we know they're exempt, we send them a link, request a certificate before we invoice them so we're not doing credits and rebills. Don't hold up products. You know, make it easy for them to give you the right information. So it's kind of my little soapbox on that, but please don't forget about that part of this process. It's very important that they can purchase from you faster and the more, the easy, more easily, they can purchase from you, the more business and happy customers you'll have. So kind of speaking of the website and the other experiences, I'll pass this back to Andrew to talk about selling in all of these different channels and the challenges related to exemption certificates there. Exactly, thanks Maria. And I think, you know, we started seeing this six years ago, but really once the pandemic hit, you know, we talked to businesses every day businesses are just changing how they sell. So traditionally it was old school, salesperson takes the order, sends in the purchase order, you invoice the customer and you know you ship to uh, where it's going or you had a brick and mortar comparison that would get to the customer that way or a marketplace or traditional B2B like I mentioned. But since the pandemic, we see so many businesses that are changing how they do direct sales, and you're having B2B customers purchase online. When I started at Avalara 10 years ago, this was something that never came up, but now with just you know the online investment and how easy, kind of to Maria's point about customers are just so used to buying online, and that's moving into the B2B setting. So we have, every day I have conversations where talking to businesses and they're trying to make it easier for their B2B sales to make purchases. And that's moving to an omni-channel approach, which includes direct-to-consumer online. And just some data on where we've seen this grow. So just in 2023, you know, this grew 17%. So it just shows you that the move is happening. B2B purchasers want to purchase quickly and they want it have to be easier. So they don't want to take the approach of having to wait on product. They want to get it. They want to purchase electronically, you know, just like a consumer would. And you can see the data there that, you know, kind of speaks to, um, you know, a hybrid sales model where you, you know, you may have people with remote interactions. You may have people with in-person interactions. So that's just changing. The landscape is moving and like that, that second to bottom bullet, 70% of decision makers are prepared to spend up to 500K on a single e-commerce transaction. That's all you need to know, right? The end consumer is not making a $500,000 online transaction. Well, at least I hope not. So, you know, businesses are doing that. So it just highlights the fact that businesses are no longer slowed down by you know, the old process and they want to purchase exempt, they want to be exempted regardless of, you know, what it is they're, they're purchasing. 
And this exactly speaks to those omni-channels. So you want to allow your customers the ability to purchase exempt, to view the certificates they have on file with you, to even give them the ability to manage the certificates. And it's real-time certificate completion, meaning you can have the ability where your customer logs into their account and they have the ability to upload their own exemption certificate. So when they check out on the e-commerce platform, immediately exempted, and it's just easy access for the purchaser, that business, to have the ability to see what they have on file and you know purchase exempt immediately. And like I said, you have the ability within you know, how you do business to have your customers exempt right in the online portal. So that's what's changed. And, you know, that's the future. So the truth is, you know, every business has sales tax compliance responsibility. Every business cares about a good customer experience, which Maria pointed out to and unfortunately, the stories I hear every day is every business can be audited. It's almost not a matter of if it's happened, it's a matter of you know when it's happened. So if you have a poor process in place during audit, do you feel confident in the ability to produce the certificates quickly when you need to? Do you feel confident in the fact that you know managing certificates, you or the team could find them quickly? or have the ability on managing the renewal process. That's why it's complicated. Every state is different when it comes to economic thresholds, and every state is different when it comes to certificates. Illinois resale expires every three years. Illinois manufacturing expires every five years. Can anyone explain why? No, we don't know. <laughs> it makes it's absolutely no sense. The <laughs> Illinois resale form is the CRT-61. The Illinois manufacturing form is the ST587. Does it make any sense? It doesn't to me, and I've been talking about it for 10 years. But that's <laughs> why it's challenging, but it still matters to you because you have to prove as a business on why and when and who you exempted. And the end customer, quite frankly, care. So you want to have a good system in place where you connect with your customers, where you have the ability to you know, give them access to seeing the certificates they have on file and understanding, you know, when they need to renew them. But like we mentioned earlier in a slide, the burden is on you. You have to prove that you're doing it the compliant way, that you're managing your exempt customers and you're maintaining your certificates. And I think this goes to you, Maria. All right. Yeah. So let's talk about audit. I get the kind of touched on it a little bit there, but yeah. uh, here you go. You did. Yeah. So I do know that most of you in the audience aren't sitting around afraid of getting audited tomorrow morning, but I can tell you in our combined experience, or I guess I can't tell you how many businesses we've talked to, right, Andrew, over the years that have been audited, large and small for sales and use tax, right? They, they will find you at some point. <laughs> so we don't want to be the scary people about audit, but we do want to at least share with you some information on what an auditor will look for. So should you get in the situation where you're audited and typically once you're audited, then it kind of triggers more audits, unfortunately, which is weird in your own state and sometimes even in neighboring states. So what they generally target, two main things, or three things really, they target Nexus oversights, as Andrew talked about. If you're not registered in my state and you're sending a bunch of stuff into my state but you're not registered here, they don't like that. They know that, as I said earlier, most people just collect some sort of document, but they don't know if it's valid, they don't know the laws around it, they don't know the expiration, they can't find it in time of audit. They know that managing exemption certificates is messy, so they're going to ask you for certificates. And they know that misreporting or incorrect use tax is an easy target for them because it's hard to do. Again, Courtney, that's a different webinar, but that is definitely something that they target. And each of these things are very prominent in the world of manufacturing, construction, wholesale distribution. You saw on our slide earlier that 60% have more than 10 states where they have nexus. 
that's a lot to manage all of those rules. As Andrew said, there's 46 jurisdictions out there that have different rules and laws. So while we're not necessarily afraid of being audited, we definitely want to make sure that we're at least close to compliant and that we are prepared should we get audited. As I always say to people, the businesses that I talk to, why do you wanna create a liability for yourself? If you can't prove to an auditor that you have an exemption certificate on file for a particular sale, guess where that money comes from for the government? Out of your pocket. It's very hard to go back to Courtney three years later and say, we sold you this item three years ago and we didn't charge you tax, but we can't find your certificate. Can you pay me the tax now? Courtney's gonna be, <laughs> no, I'm not gonna do that, right? So it's very hard to do, you're creating liability for yourself if you don't manage these things well. So they're gonna look for invoices that don't show sales tax. They're gonna say, hey, you have all these invoices with no tax for all these customers over these dates. Give me your certificates. Really hard to pull for the average cust customer if you don't have a good system in place. And the cost of an audit is high. I talk to a lot of businesses, over $100,000. Talk to a lot of businesses that say, yeah, but we only ended up paying like 20,000. But how much does that cost you over several months of your staff's time meeting with that auditor, pouring through documents, just dealing with the audit? People forget about that cost, just working with the audit. So if you do get audited, you want to be able to respond to them quickly. And then having the, having the attitude that, oh, we'll never get audited, I, Andrew and I can guarantee that's not true. We hear stories of all sizes of businesses every day. I think I've already covered this, but most of audits are completed within a few weeks, but it does take your staff 35 plus hours to deal with that. So just think about the staff that is not doing their job because you're just pouring through paperwork. And also don't forget that these audits can go back many years. So I always have people that say, oh, well, we can just delete these certificates, delete the old certificates that are expired. No, 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 you can't do that. You need to save these exemption certificates and have them accessible. Nobody audits you for yesterday. They audit you for three or four years back. So you need to save these documents until that state audit look back period expires. This is just kind of the same thing we've been talking about, reasons for audit penalties, that sales and use tax, so that's the obvious part. There's managing exemption certificates or errors with exemption certificates. Late filings, that one's always a surprise to me. It's like missed deadlines, failure to register, that's Nexus again, and of course, use tax. These are all things that I know fall into your purview, and these are all things that an auditor can find. So. We're talking about getting systems in place to help with the complexity, especially the complexity that Economic Nexus has put in front of us. Unfortunately, I call Economic Nexus, Andrew, the gift that keeps on giving because everybody has Nexus everywhere. If you have Nexus and your vendor's selling more goods into states, then they're asking you for more certificates and you register in more states and you have to ask your customers for more certificates. I just picture certificate exemption certificates flying everywhere in the country right now. And it's only going to get more complicated. It's not like they're making it easier. No, we didn't actually point out on the slide that you showed that showed the economic nexus limits for states. The first one was, oh, shoot, I forget which state it was. Courtney, do you remember? One of the states is changing their economic nexus threshold as of July 1. I forget yeah. which state. Oh, but yeah. I think it's going. Wyoming. Wyoming? Yeah. I think it's on the slide back there. I don't want to speak yeah. out of turn, but I think it might be yeah. Wyoming. <laughs> So, yeah, but that's my point is there, it's always changing. It, mm -hmm. so even for us, we're like, really? Again? So yeah. so let's talk about, I think it sticks with me for a little bit for Andrew. So let's talk about a slide that I, we, Andrew and I have been using this slide for 10 years, right, Andrew? Um, I still like it because I think it really demonstrates what we think of as consumers. We think sales tax equals the tax calculation that we as consumers see on our receipts when we buy things. So we think sales tax calculation. But for a business, there's all of these things underneath this iceberg that are important. You have to worry about being ready, ready for an audit, filing on time, your website. How do we calculate tax and collect certificates on our website? How do we understand our tax laws, our use tax? All these things, of course, customer sought, we've already talked about a couple of times. All these things underneath the iceberg are also the responsibility of you as a business. 
So we kind of look at it at Avalara as there's five steps to getting tax compliant. Number one is understand where your business is, your business needs to collect tax. That's where do those laws apply to you that Andrew talked about and get registered where you need to be. Even if it's a zero dollar return once a year, you do need to get registered. Validate those documents for those customers that want to be tax exempt, collect the right form, make sure it's valid and maintain it, keep it up to date. And that's mostly what we're talking about today. If you do have tax to be calculated on some, some percentage of your orders, make sure you're calculating the right amount of tax. Tax rates aren't by zip codes, they're by taxing jurisdictions, and they're also on a product by product basis. Make sure you're doing that right. And of course, file on time. So this is what Av what Avalara looks at as the, the process to getting compliant. And then if you look at that in a software, from a software perspective, from an automation perspective, this is how we recommend doing it. So the first part of the, the project for most of you out there is getting those exemption certificates valid. Know who your customers are that want to have them, request them and validate them and convert yourself from paper to digital. We should not be in the paper world anymore. And a PDF is just an image of a piece of paper. It is not electronic data. The next part is do a tax determination at the time of sale. Know whether or not that customer is exempt at the time of every invoice. Unfortunately, most of us will just mark a customer exempt everywhere for all time in our ERP and not think anything else about it. But with the economic nexus and all the different forms we've talked about, you've got to know which state the customer is exempt in and do I have the right document and is it not expired at the time of that actual invoice creation? It's more complex than an ERP can handle. And that tax determination needs to be able to communicate with your exemption certificate system so it can make a live determination. As I said, not just marking a customer exempt is not gonna solve the problem because it does not mark them exempt on a state-by-state -state basis, doesn't know when it expires, et cetera. So you have to have a system where your tax determination includes the exemption certificates. And then with our system, that all of the invoice information then stays in the system so that forms can be filled out dynamically and we can file your sales tax returns guaranteed on time. What was that line we saw? Some certain percent of late filings that auditors catch. Well, when you use a system, your filings won't be late. They'll be accurate and they'll be on time. And then to add to that, it is also a really nice to have a system where your customers can communicate with your ERP. I mean, excuse me, your customer list from your exemption certificate management communicates with your ERP. So it's a bonus, a lot of our integrations have this, you can build this so that you're not keeping up two customer records. That's really kind of what a tax determination cloud-based suite can look like. Doesn't mean you have to do all of it, but that's kind of the full, full solution. Uh, I can't remember when it goes back to you. I'll just keep going, Andrew. So keeping track of Nexus and doing that Nexus study is always the first thing that we recommend that you do as a part of that process. So understand, this is the part that is understand where your business has to collect and remit tax, which is gonna increase your complexity, which means automation is something that you should be considered. It should be considered because you just simply can't manage all of these rules. Heck, Andrew and I don't know them, all the rates and rules and requirements for every state. And with that, I think we have another poll question, Courtney. Yep, this is our third CPE poll question. So again, it, it will show up on the same window where the slides usually appear. We'll go through this pretty quickly. I know that we're getting a ton, a ton of great questions that are coming in. <laughs> fast. How automated is your exemption certificate management? So we have uh, options from one to five, one being almost nothing is automated, all the way up to five, we're automated almost everything you can or anything in between. So we'll give folks just a couple of seconds to answer this, and then we'll move on and try to get to as many questions as we can. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the results here. We're not going to spend too much time on the results, but this one is always interesting to see. I think not too surprisingly, about 22% have said that they're kind of in the middle, but actually almost 60%, 57% are saying that almost nothing is automated. And this is a 
perfect segment into our next section, which talks a little bit about nation with an exemption certificate. So Andrew, this is where it goes back over to you. Excellent. <clears throat> Thanks, Courtney. So, I mean, we just saw from the poll, most of everyone on the call, ha over half of everyone on the call doesn't have a process in place. Well, Avalara can take that off your plate. So if you're not managing your exempt customers and maintaining your certificates, of course, we have a full uh, software solution that can help with that. We can help you collect the certificates. You use AI assisted validation that we built, give you the ability to track on your customers upon renewal. So you can have automatic email requests send out to your customers. If you're in those states that expire, every state's different. As we mentioned, some are every year, some are every three years. That's all dependent on the states you're in, who you sell to, the different reasons a business are exempt, which I mentioned earlier. But this is kind of a visual on the complete end-to-end -end life cycle of certificate. Now our software can help you manage that from beginning to end, from acquiring to securing, and then renewal process, you know, if and when it's needed. I know we're getting up on time here, Courtney, so I'll kind of slide through here. So in addition to having software and being a user of the software, the tools, of course, help you manage that life cycle of a certificate, the validation, the requesting, the renewal process. If you are happen to be a team of one or you have a team that is focused on many things like you know, ge uh, revenue generating activities, which exemption certificate management is not one of them. It's a, a governmental requirement. If you need help with that, well, once you own a subscription to our exemptions module, then if you want to, you can engage our managed services team. You can outsource the work to our managed services team. They can help you on a one-time project up front. They can help you on a recurring basis, but basically the team can do that function for you, which is reach out to your customers via email, via postal mail. They can validate the documents you have, get them into the system, and then just manage the renewal process. So in addition to putting in a good system in place, using a good automated tool, Avalara, of course, provides managed services if and when your team ever needs that. And of course, you know, through the connection, which Maria kind of showed in the workflow, you know, if you connect Avatax, which is our tax engine, to your ERP or to your e-commerce sites, you have the ability to get you know, live tax calls and that can integrate right along with as well. So the exemptions module talks to the tax engine and allows you to have your customers purchase exempt you know, as they're checking out or as you're invoicing them. And then you know, we've talked about the customer side the whole time, but if you all have many businesses we talk to have requirements where you as a business are purchasing exempt. So you have a network of suppliers or vendors that you provide your own exemption certificate to, whether you're a manufacturer, resale, et cetera. And you want to have the ability to track your vendors and see the states that you need to send them a certificate to and when you need to do it and where you need to do it. There is a vendor module that is built into our tool that can help you there as well. And, you know, the part of, you know, automating this process, and this is Maria's favorite line, you want to turn paper into pixels. Okay. So she mentioned it's, it's, it's far more than just having paper documents anymore. You know, are they searchable? You know, you're guessing if you have the certificate on file, you have to look through an old, you know, accordion file cabinet or whatnot, but you remove the guesswork when you digitize this process and automate it. And it just helps you reduce your risk, make you more effective, more efficient in the process and take the burden off of you. And these are all the reasons why customers automate tax compliance. This is essentially why Avalara has been in business for 20 years. You get to have accuracy, assurance on getting the correct tax rate and efficiency better customer experience, and then just, you know, you're going to grow. So you need to have software and automation to grow with you. And I may have, may have taken that slide from you, Maria. Okay. Yeah. Why don't we, 
I think we're talking about. What I mean, the this kind of, it's are, just following yeah, this, up on basically what we just said already. Yeah, this is the savings. So we just recently did a, a, a total an impact study at Avalara with some customers. And these are this is the raw data from the savings that our customers actually have experienced by using our system. A lot of things in tax compliance are these hidden costs that nobody does the math of. It's never one person. It's people across the organization collecting these certificates, validating these certificates, dealing with the audits, right? There's a lot of people and nobody does the math. So we had our customers actually do the math so that we could quantify the impact of adding automation from what you're, you're currently doing manually. So you won't regret it, I'll tell you that. And then I'll leave you with my next slide, which is kind of my takeaway. I developed this list of questions many years back now that I usually send our my people that I speak with away with. And it is, I kind of like, you know, in the old fashioned where we were actually in a physical boardroom, stick this up on the wall and talk through those. How do we plan to collect these documents in all these new states? How do we know they're accurate? Is our current process actually scalable? What happens in an audit? Can we afford delays and orders? Do we want to keep doing these credits and rebills? So just things to think about. This is my takeaway. Think about how you're doing it now and explore automation. It will save you money. It'll save you time. I promise people don't, don't undo it once you've gone there. I always say it's kind of like giving back your iPhone. With that, we have a last poll question and then hopefully have five minutes for at least a few questions, Courtney. Yeah, we'll try to answer them fast. But this is our last poll question. I'm going to leave this up for a little bit while we are while we start going through Q&A. But if you're interested in receiving a follow-up from an Avalara sales representative, go ahead and mark this as yes. I mean, you'll be kind of prioritized with our sales team. So if you're interested in learning more about Avalara ECM or any of our other products and how they might work for your business, go ahead and select yes, and we'll have someone get in touch with you as soon as we can. All right, questions. We have had more than 127 questions come in. Ooh. So obviously we are not gonna get through all of them, but I have seen a few come in about validating an exemption certificate. So we talked about validation. What does that mean? Do you have any tips or tricks on what to look for when you're validating a certificate? Yeah, so the system guides you on that exactly. Whether you're managing you know, one or you load in 200, you can load in a certificate into our software and it will do its best to read it. If it's a certificate, it recognizes it, it, it gives you AI assisted validation. You as a user, or you can engage our managed services still need to make the final decision, but the software can read most of it. And what validating a certificate means is you need to identify data points that matter, like what state is it? What's the start date? When does it expire? And then sp specific certificates for resale may be different than manufacturing. So there's probably five to six data points you need to verify each certificate. And one is the state, when it starts, when it ends, the exemption reason, and then the tax ID in certain states are required. And depending on the states, you can do that right in the tool as well. Awesome, thank you. One follow-up question to that. Anne Marie said that they had a customer who sent in a blank certificate where they didn't fill out the company or their company information. Does that make the certificate invalid or can they go back in and update it? Well, we're, we're you know, I'm not a tax attorney or a state auditor. I'm not even a CPA, quite frankly. I'm just somebody who's worked at Avalara for 10 years. But in that case, I would believe that's not a good certificate. It should be completed. The buyer and seller information should be on that. It's up to you if you want to enter that data. You could enter the data in the tool, but if you get audited against that form, you know it might raise red flags to the auditor that that field was missing. So our recommendation would be you should push back on that customer and ask for a completed form. Got it, okay. And then I've also seen a few questions come in, knowing that every state has its own guidelines for when exemption certificates expire, if they, if they expire, what are best practices around when to update a resale certificate in general? Is it, do we have any recommendations? Great question. So within the tool, we give you the ability to reach out to the customers prior to expiration, 120, 90, 60, or 30 days out. There's no specific magic time frame, I usually default to a 90 day warning. So your first email prior to renewal is 90 days out. And then the tool lets you email them four additional times prior to that. So if the certificate still doesn't come in, you can continue to send out emails. 
but I think 90 days is a good sweet spot there for the states that do expire. And then I guess for states that don't expire, what are the best practices for how often you should be updating those? Another great question. We recommend a seven year period. This month in a CPA firm recommended three years. To me, that's a little bit of overkill, but the ones that don't expire, we always recommend seven years. Okay. States can go back that far in an audit. So seven year period we think is a good, you know, safe zone, if you will. Okay. And that was actually going to be one of my other questions. Someone was asking, what is the look back period for an audit? So it sounds like it's seven years. Every state's different. I've heard some go back 10 years, but it's typically seven. More commonly, it's usually three years. So like they might audit you this year for what you did in 2021, 22, okay. perhaps. Gotcha. All right. Let's see if we can get one more in here. So someone asked, can we collect exemption certificates retrospectively? I think the answer is you can, but maybe better question is, should you? <laughs> yeah, you absolutely can. Depending on the states, you know, in the audit, some will allow it, but you, you absolutely can. If you know you've had tax exempt customers and you've been invoicing them with no tax since 2018, I would absolutely try to go back and get them. Yeah. Now, whether they pass an audit, it's up to you. And between, I mean, not up to you, between you and the auditor, because if you get audited for, you know, a state that expires, for example, Illinois resale, if you're getting audited in 2020, you need to have the certificate that was good in that time frame. So you'd have to communicate with your customers, hey, we're asking for a certificate that was good in this time frame. So that will help you, you know, set it up for success. Awesome. All right. Well, we are right at the top of the hour. I know Maria has a busy day and she already had to jump. Andrew, I know you have some upcoming calls, but thank you again so much for taking time out of your day to share your expertise. Obviously, you and Maria are just a wealth of information when it comes to this. We got a lot more questions than we were able to answer in the time today. We do have our attendees, your information, your email address. So we will do our best to go through these questions and get you some information that you're looking for. Just a couple of final reminders. This webinar was recorded, so you will receive a link to the recording within the next 24 hours. And that also includes a link back to this console. So if there are any other resources that you'd like to check out, or if you just need to access your CPE certificate after the fact, you will be able to access this specific console and get access to all of that. And then we also have, if you go to avalera.com slash webinars, that has all of our upcoming and on-demand webinars. So I always recommend going to that, checking it out, and seeing if there are any other past or upcoming webinars that might be able to help you get more information about navigating the complex web that is tax compliance. But hopefully you found this information helpful and we will see you for one of our future webinars very soon. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Courtney.